let's just to go back for a moment. Now that we have second generation BTK inhibitors, so a calibrutinib, um, and the frontline studies with a calibrutinib as well, do you foresee a change? And, and we have other second generation xanabrutinib as well, um, you know, coming down the pike. Um, do you see a change in? We know that many patients do well on a brutinib, and then there are those that do have these troublesome side effects and do come off therapy due to hypertension and atrial fibrillation. But what do you think about the acalabrutinib data? Um, I know the xanabrutinib data is more immature and nothing in frontline, but how do you feel? And there are head-to-head -head trials, right, that were closed, but sure. we just don't sure, have that data <clears throat> of acala versus abrutinib or xanabrutinib versus abrutinib. So what do you think? Do you think the second generations will replace abrutinib? I think right now we are in this uh, situation where we can tell for sure the second generation BTK inhibitors are very effective. Uh, but what we don't know for sure is that they are d definitively better in terms of side effects and toxicity. Uh, so there's going to be a transition time right now. Um, patients who have uh, or who are developing problems on ibrutinib, for example, could potentially be switched uh, to the other BTK inhibitors right now. That's a calabrutinib, which recently was approved. And then the hope would be that those side effects uh, do not recur. There's some data to suggest that. Uh, is, there, is there an immediate replacement? I don't think uh, so, because ibrutinib data are uh, very solid in terms of long-term follow-up uh, and in terms of a lot of uh, comparative large trials which uh, support the use of ibrutinib. So it's going to be, in my opinion, a gradual thing. And uh, the really defining uh, answer to that question would be these randomized studies. I know acalabrutinib is doing that mm -hmm. right now, but xanabrutinib, which is uh, third in line, is also doing a randomized study, yeah, ibrutinib yeah. versus uh, this uh, kinase inhibitor. And uh, once those data come out, then everybody can uh, probably make a more uh, profound decision on which one to use. So based on the Elevate data, um, have you switched over? Um, is there advantages that you see for uh, the Acala, Oben, and Tuzumab? Or again, like Jan was saying, Abrutinib still remains standard of care right now. So I think uh, before I ad address that question, then I'll tell you my personal preference. Um, um, we're talking about Abrutinib intolerance patients, patients who stop ibrutinib because of a side effect. Uh, because I think we all realize that patients who stop because of a side effect and can't continue are a completely different group of patients as compared to patients who actually truly progress. Yes. And one thing that I see in my practice, and maybe you guys see in your practices too, is that the leukocytosis that happen with BTK inhibitors is an expected if, if effect. It's not necessarily an adverse event. and there is no reason to use a CD20 antibody to necessarily mitigate that adverse event. So you don't use a CD20, and I think that's the message that I wanted to be clear, clear about. The leukocytosis is not an adverse event. We don't stop the drug for that expected event. And we can even argue that and sometimes it might be even better. But the reason for using a CD20 ofatumumab, obinutuzumab, rituximab, that's not a reason to use the CD20 antibody because we know that that would happen and patients would normalize in a few weeks and we don't really feel that that's uh, uh, related to anything. Now, in terms of whether I would use acalabrutinib versus abrutinib, I think that's a very nuanced uh, decision and it is based on a lot of different things. You asked about whether you would use one versus the other, whether you would switch and there is some early data that if you switch from a brutinib to a calabrutinib, there does appear to be less of a recurrence of the original side effects that led to the discontinuation of a brutinib. Having said that, again, the numbers are small, it's early data, and we can't make any concrete decisions, but there does appear to be slight trend towards better tolerability with a calabrutinib in the early going. Whether that'll pan out in larger head-to-head -head studies, only time will tell. So until we um, know that it's a completely different drug, I think we, I, for me, it's all one generation of drugs. They're exactly the same drugs hitting the same target, 16481. And I think right now it's a coin flip. Now, if somebody has a very clear cut history of cardiovascular issues, I do have a discussion with them about possibly considering alternative therapies, which may be a little safer, although that same thing can happen with the brutinib. Monitoring is exactly the same for both of my patient groups, even if I decide to do it. 
And I'll, for just for, to be completely honest, my first choice for all my patients is always treatment on a clinical trial to address exactly those questions. Do you want to comment about the second generation and, and whether or not you, how they fit into the treatment landscape? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, from my perspective and speaking about patients who are, you know, not going on clinical trials but who are looking at the, the standard treatment options, I actually do believe that BTK inhibitor therapy um, as a single agent is the best current therapy that we have for most of our patients. And it's important to recognize that um, we certainly can predict patients who might run into trouble, patients with prior atrial fibrillation, patients with poorly controlled hypertension, dilated hearts, um, those sort of things that would definitely make me want to steer clear from a BTK inhibitor therapy. And we do have other options, and that's important. Right now, I believe that the cardiac risk profiles of all three are probably going to be the same when we get the data. So I don't use one to substitute for the other if I do have concerns about that. I do believe that a calibrutinib is probably a little bit better tolerated than ibrutinib and xanabrutinib, but I think the tolerability of all these agents is excellent. The big uh, problem with the calibrutinib, of course, is the need to avoid proton pump inhibitors, which so many people are, are on. So it's just nice to have different options that you can tailor to the individuals. You know, the important question I always come across is whether or not to add an anti-CD20 to it. And at this point in time, I always use single-agent BTK inhibitor therapy without the anti-CD20. Okay, so that's fair.